Hello class. In session time, we'll be looking at exception handling, which is catching errors so that they don't cause our programs to cancel, and doing something based on what kind of error has occurred, depending on what our application needs are. As you look at the assignments this week, it looks like a busy week, so be prepared. Remember that some assignments from chapter nine, or I'm sorry, session nine, will carry over and be due on 11.1, as will all of these activities. So you have two exercises that are both pretty small and shouldn't cause you too much trouble. You'll just be adding some error handling to some exercises that should be very simple for you to complete. There's also a bonus assignment opportunity this week, so in, take a look at that and let me know if you have any questions if you're interested in trying to complete this task. It requires a little bit of research on your end, but gives you a chance to get some extra points. Um, it's time to finish up the Design Patterns Discussion Board. Don't forget about that. And notice that your chapter quiz will not be due this week. It will be next week. So we'll be doing a little bit more error handling in our unit next week. So please, again, watch these due dates. We have a lot due on the first. Um, each of these items should be small enough to handle, but it does look like a lot. Let's take a look at the textbook PowerPoint for this chapter, chapter 12, our error handling or exception handling chapter. When we run into a runtime error, some sort of unexpected condition as our program is executing, it causes a cancellation or an abnormal termination for our user. We need to handle things a little bit better than that. Nobody likes to be using a program that abnormally terminates right in the middle of things. You know how that is. So how can we handle these runtime errors so that we can continue to run or terminate gracefully? And that's what we're looking at in this chapter. So as usual, in our never ending Java text, we have a lot of objectives for this chapter. This one is a lot more manageable though than some. Now, some things that we can look at as examples for code. Let's look at this one, showing a runtime error. Our quotient example will show us the never ever allowed divide by zero runtime exception. We always want to make sure that we're doing defensive programming and not allowing a divide by zero exception to occur. Here's a divide by zero exception. We are prompting the user to enter two integers. We read in those integers and then we do division without any sort of checking. Bad, bad us, right? Now, what if we add an if statement? Here we're saying, okay, we're gonna prompt the user for two integers, but we're gonna use an if statement to say, if number two is not zero, that's gonna be our divisor, then go ahead and output the answer, the result to this division. Otherwise, give our user an error. The divisor cannot be zero. Loud washer. Okay, what about fixing it with a method? Here we have a division, and in this case, we've created a class. And in our class, we have a quotient method, and our quotient method expects two integers, number one and number two. We check to see if number two is zero, and if so, we return a message, divisor cannot be zero, and exit with a non-zero return code to indicate to our caller that we had a problem. And let's look at our tester method for that. Our main sets up the scanner, prompts the user for two integers, and then calls the quotient method to get that answer and outputs that. So that's a way that we can prevent that error from occurring, right? But we can also use some exception handling. And the advantages of using exception handling is that we don't have to worry about sending return codes back and forth, and we can kind of do things a little bit more gracefully. So let's take a look at that example. 
Here we have, again, a class quotient with example, or exception, sorry. And we have our method that returns an integer named quotient. And we have two parameters as integers that are passed into this method. We have an if statement here, and we say, if that divisor is zero, throw an arithmetic exception with the message divisor cannot be zero. Otherwise, return the result. Now in our tester program, we have set up a scanner. We prompt the user for the two integers. Now we implement this structure called a try catch. And a try catch is kind of an embedded code that we're going to put around or wrap around some code to try to see if something will work. And if it works, we'll do what we tried to do. But if it doesn't, we'll catch the error and do some sort of processing based on the error that we catch. So let's take a look at how that's implemented. We start with the keyword try with opening curly braces, and then we put the code that we would like to try within this try block. So in this example, we set up an integer named result, and we try to call our quotient method. If our quotient method throws an exception, we're going to return down to this catch block. If it does not, we're going to continue on and output the answer to that division. Now, in our catch block, we're saying we want to catch an arithmetic exception. And notice that's the type of exception that we throw up here. So in our catch, we output a message and say, hey, there's an exception, and an integer cannot be divided by zero. And then at the end, we continue on with our execution. So this prevents our user from seeing those awful cancellation methods, even though it may have been their fault, right, because they entered a zero as a divisor. We want to make sure that we're being defensive in our programming style and intercepting those kinds of errors. So notice how the try catch just wraps around your code to make sure that an error can be intercepted. In this example, we actually throw the error, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the error is thrown by the system and we still can use a try catch block to catch that error and prevent abnormal termination of our program. Now in this example, we have a mismatched ex input exception. So let's take a look at it. In this example, we are going to prompt our user to enter an integer. And we're gonna output the number they entered and not continue input. But if the input fails because they did not type a number, an error will be thrown by the system. And we'll catch that error here is an input mismatch exception. And we can say, hey, try again, an integer is required. Now, this is a great way for us to handle verifying user input because notice that we don't have to do any sort of um, unusual methods or anything. We just try to use the number, and if we can't, we catch the error and continue on and tell the user that we need better input. Now, notice that all of this is enclosed or wrapped in a do while, and in that do while loop, we're saying do all this information while we need to continue prompting the user for input. So in our try, we say, hey, we got done. We don't need to continue input. But in our catch, we do not reset that Boolean so that we can continue prompting the user for input. So a nice way for us to handle that kind of verification. Now, there are several different types of exceptions that can be thrown and that we can throw. All of these are part of the object class. We have a throwable class that inherits from the object class. And then we have exceptions and errors. We can have many different kinds of errors that have to do with the system set date, 
We're normally more concerned with exceptions that occur within our program, like unable to read a file, an I.O. exception. Um, we have many times types of runtime exceptions, an arithmetic exception, like our divide by zero example, um, an index out of bounds exception. You may have encountered one of those when you were working with arrays in our chapters that handled array processing. You saw that if your index gets too large for the size of the array, that exception is thrown, and many, many, many more classes and exception types. Now, our system errors are thrown by the Java virtual machine, and they, like they say here, there's, there's really not much you can do if one of these system errors occurs. Um, just try to, you know, close your connection or terminate gracefully in the best way that you can. But exceptions we can handle. So these are the kinds of things we want to implement a try-catch block for to make sure that we are handling errors. All right. Now, a runtime exception and the errors and their subclasses are known as unchecked exceptions. All other exceptions are known as checked exceptions, meaning that the compiler forces the programmer to check and deal with those exceptions. Now, with unchecked exceptions, we usually have, are looking at some sort of logic error, like a null pointer, index out of bounds. These are logic errors that should be corrected. So these kinds of things can occur anywhere in your program. So we don't want to really be trying to use a lot of try-catch blocks for these kinds of things. In your assignments, you will, so that you can implement a try-catch in a reasonable way. But in general, these kinds of exceptions should be handled by your program properly. Okay. Now, in our example at the beginning, we saw that we could throw an exception. So it's kind of like a baseball game over here. Method two is throwing an exception that's going to be caught by method one. And method one is going to do something with that exception. Why would we want to throw an exception? Well, maybe we've created a class and we've decided that we only accept certain valid data types and somebody tries to pass us something that's invalid. We can throw an exception and say, nope, we're just throwing that right out of here. We're not going to take it. And then the calling method can catch that and decide what to do with it. When you want to throw an exception, you can declare it. But every method must state the types of, ex of checked exceptions it might throw. So this de declaration will allow you to throw a certain exception. So for example, my method here throws an IO exception and an other exception. Then you can throw that exception. So here's our example. And of course, they had the example at the beginning of the presentation. Here's one where we're looking at a radius. Um, if the radius is greater than or equal to zero, we calculate it. If not, we throw a new illegal argument exception and say, hey, the radius cannot be negative. Notice this is how we implement that throws keyword in our method declaration. We have our parameters with our opening and closing parentheses. And then after that, we say the types of exceptions that this method may throw. In our catch, we can catch certain types of exceptions so that we can do certain things with them. Here we have an example. P2 throws an I.O. exception. If a file does not exist, it throws this new I.O. exception. If this is called by P1, P1 will be able to catch that error. Let's take a look at this code, a circle with an exception. In this code, we're looking at a class that creates a circle, a circle object, and our circle object has a class field of a radius 
and the number of objects. In our constructor, we construct a circle with exception and we say that its radius is one. As we look through our code, we see that when we do our set radius method, we throw the illegal argument exception from this method. So if somebody sends us a radius that is greater than or equal to zero, we calculate the radius. Otherwise, we throw an illegal argument exception. So we can construct our circle using some sort of tester class and be able to see that we could throw this exception. There's the tester class. I'll run it for you. Let's see if it'll let me. Probably not. Oh, come on. Nope. It tried. Let's take a look at the code. Let you run it on your machine. I will get mine configured, but I have not done so. Now, here's our tester with our main. We have a try block, and we say we want to create a new circle with exception. Call it C1, and its radius is going to be 5, or we're going to calculate its radius based on 5. And then C2, we send a negative number, and C3, we send a 0. When we try to catch our error, we're going to print out the exception method. So you should definitely run this circle test so that you can see what all that exception information is. All right. So some great examples in your book and in Ravel. I know it can take, again, a lot of your time, but it's definitely worth doing those kinds of things. Now, when we work with the try-catch block, we have a third clause to that, and that's the finally clause. And the finally clause consists of statements that will be executed no matter what. So if our try is successful, we will execute all of the statements in our try block, then our finally block. If our try is unsuccessful and we catch an error, we'll execute the statements in our catch block then we will execute all of the statements in our finally block. So it kind of says, finally, no matter what happened, I'd like to execute these lines of code. So here's kind of a little animation of that happening, that no matter what, our finally statements are always executed. All right. We have a lot of animations here. Now, some cautions. Exception handling separates error handling code from normal programming tasks, and it makes programs easier to read and modify. However, exception handling usually requires more time and resources because it requires instantiating a new exception object, rolling back the call stack, and propagating the errors to the calling methods. So system overhead is involved in using a try-catch block. When you catch that error, there is some system overhead going on that you should be aware of. So again, handling it in a way to make sure that you don't encounter an exception is of course the preferred method, but then we still wanna make sure that we have exception handling included for the just-in-case situations. Now, usually you want to make sure you're throwing exceptions in your methods. Um, if you want the exception to be processed by its caller, you should create an exception object and throw it. If you can handle the exception yourself in the method, then there's no need to throw that exception. Just take care of it and do whatever it is that you need to do. Now, again, don't try to use try catch to use with simple expected situations. Be careful with that. We can also define custom exception classes. This can get um, into some very customizable features of Java so that maybe for our system that we're implementing, we might have certain exceptions that to us cause problems that we can't recover from and we can create 
exception classes. They have several examples here for you that I'll let you take a look at. Now we can also use assertions and an assertion is just basically a compiler directive that's used to assure program correctness and avoid logic errors. So an assertion is declared using the keyword assert. When an assertion statement is executed, Java evaluates the assertion. If the Boolean included in the assertion is false, an assertion error will be thrown. The assertion error class has a NOAR constructor and several overloaded single argument constructors. So the assert statement will take care of this assertion error. Let's take a look here. So here we say, I want to make sure that i is equal to 10. And then we do another assert statement that says the sum is greater than 10 and the sum is less than 5 times 10. And output the words sum is and our sum. So if you're using the assertion, you need to be careful to use the right version of the Java compiler. And again, this is kind of like saying that I has to be equal to one of these things as we demonstrate using this code, or else we're going to have some sort of error thrown. Now, assertion basically is saying that I want to enforce this level of correctness in my variables. So you definitely could look at a little bit more information about it. But exception handling addresses robustness and assertion addresses correctness. So assertion is a way to implement your business rules saying that, you know, on, only these certain variable values are allow, allowed. These assertions are checked at runtime and can be turned on or off as you execute your program. So they can be very nice to use. Here is setting our radius using the assertion. Here's another good case where we have a, a case statement. And if we hit the default, we say, hey, there's an assert that you've given us an invalid month. So it's just a way for us to take care of kind of throwing an error by saying this assertion was not satisfied. Now, in your book and in Revel for this chapter, you'll see there's some information about using file names, lots of great stuff, using Java I.O. so that you can read through some files. And there's a great case study in the book that gives you some ideas of how to read through files and folders. You'll really like doing some of these examples. And text IO is oftentimes error ridden. That's why there is some information about doing file IO in our chapter here about exception handling, because we know that anytime we're working with users or files, we can have exceptions occur that are outside of our control. So text IO gives us a great opportunity to talk about some of that exception handling. And finally, there's a great case study that shows you how you can read data from the web and even gives you some information on creating a web crawler. So you should take a look at that case study. It gives you some great information. Um, you can use different links to follow and um, have some great things going on there, a lot of power. Um, do take a look at that one. I think you'll like it. Don't make too much again out of this chapter. Um, if you have trouble understanding the concepts, please give me a call or send me an email, preferably. But basically, we're just taking existing code and wrapping a try-catch block around it to make sure that if an error occurs, we catch that error and we know how to continue on and process and end in a graceful manner so that we don't have an abrupt failure for our users to deal with. Hope you have a great week.